I'm Rob Skinner, and this is the Rob Skinner Podcast. Today on episode 66, my guest has taken a stuck and stagnant church and doubled it in only two years. He's found a way to motivate and inspire older disciples. He's going to share with you today how you can do it. That's coming up on the Rob Skinner Podcast. Welcome back to the Rob Skinner Podcast. My goal is to inspire you to live a no regrets life, make this life count, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Today we're going to Reno, Nevada Nevada, to talk to Kai Foster, former runway model and now leader of the Reno Church of Christ. Kai's done an amazing job reviving the health of a church that has floundered for years. Kai, welcome to the program. Great to be here. Great to be here. Kai, can you go ahead and share with me how you became a Christian? I was reached out to uh, many years ago in uh, 93 um, in while I was in Hollywood. And uh, the church at the time had the Upside Down Club, which the church had bought a nightclub in the middle of Hollywood. I went there and uh, heard uh, First Principles preached uh, as a Sunday sermon and uh, was converted about three weeks later. Wow. And so th- that must have been an exciting time, early 90s, I'm guessing? Yeah, 93. Okay. And so you were a part of the AMS ministry, is that right? That's right, arts ministry. Okay. What were you What were you doing for work at that time? What What brought you to L.A.? I had been modeling. I lived in the suburbs of L.A. in Orange County had been modeling for about eight years, eight, nine years. And I moved to uh, Hollywood and um, lived right on the boulevard, right off of, <laughs> right off of uh, Hollywood Boulevard, uh, right near Sunset as well. And uh, was doing runway modeling and uh, waiting tables and doing all sorts of things on the side. And then as I was uh, waiting tables in a restaurant there, I was reached out. Okay. This is a total diversion side side note, but I am a music lover, and I know you're a huge, huge music lover. Yeah. Did you ever get to see Van Halen or Guns N' Roses there at any <laughs> concerts there in, in Hollywood there in the early 90s, late 80s? I did. I did. I started going to concerts when I was really young, uh, 12 years old with my brothers, and uh, to this very day, uh, with the exception of COVID, I still go often. Um, I was able to see every version of of uh, Van Halen, and uh, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> it was all great. Um, and then with uh, with Guns N' Roses, because I was in the arts ministry, and many of the members in that ministry worked either uh, behind the scenes or in admin. Um, I went to one of the uh, Guns N' Roses uh, album release parties at Universal Studios. Oh my gosh, that is crazy. You know, sometimes I, I watch these old, uh, you know, biopics about these bands, um, Eagles or, or whatever. I just wish I could walk back, go back in time and see some of these smaller concerts in venues in, in uh, the Los Angeles area. It'd be so awesome. Yeah. But, but you were there. Must have been amazing. It was great. It was really great. Yeah. Well, how, so you became a Christian. How did you meet BJ? BJ had been on Broadway and uh, was doing a soap opera as well on the East Coast. Reached out to there in the arts ministry in New York okay. under Stephen Lisa Johnson. And then she came to LA to help build and really start the MS arts ministry uh, here and or there in LA, she was uh, she was a disciple in that ministry when I was first coming around, and uh, and when I was first converted, I heard her give her testimony twice because the ministry was fairly small, 
but um, she had her her testimony was incredibly impactful because she had turned down um, major opportunities in her career because of the content and walked away from it. And even before I was baptized, when I heard her give her testimony and I was realizing who she was talking about, because she was talking about very prominent people and it would have set her up for life mm. as a young black actress, but she walked away from it. So it really impacted me. We became friends and, um, uh, we got married, uh, in, uh, 94 in that ministry and went in the full-time ministry and been in the, in the full-time ministry ever since. Okay. So she was in, in New York in the daytime ministry, but then right. she came out to LA. What brought her out there? Uh, she came out to help build up the arts ministry in LA. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it, it was, it was basically a ministry move. Um, and also career to a certain extent, but she wanted to help build the arts ministry in LA. Mm -hmm. It was my perspective that, you know, a lot of people in AMS ministry were wanting to succeed, not necessarily had achieved it quite yet, but it, it always seemed to me that BJ was someone who had already arrived to a certain degree. She was a regular on, what, uh, what was the name of the soap opera? She was on a soap opera, um, Another World. Another World. And she was on that soap for a number of years. And um, so she worked regularly. So you're talking about someone who had had achieved that kind of success, right. but still shows God and spiritual things above that. Hmm. And that was pretty remarkable to me. I see. So a runway model and a soap opera star. That seems, <laughs> seems like a match made in heaven. <laughs> yeah. You must have been the it couple in your ministry back in the day. <laughs> Back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so give give me the rundown. Where has the ministry taken you? If you can just give me an update on, you know, 94 to most recently, <laughs> where have you where's so God, God 94 taken? to 2000 we okay. were in in LA in the arts ministry. Mm -hmm. Then we went down to San Diego and we were uh, in, in more inland San Diego, San Diego is pretty large. So we were inland San Diego, um, from 2000, uh, to 2004. And then we moved from there to coastal San Diego, um, uh, just a few miles off the beach, which was amazing. We were there for eight years that brought us to 2012. And then we went from there to just above San Diego and Temecula. Uh, and we were there for about five years. And then um, we came to Reno in uh, 2018. Okay, 2018. Now, uh, having been a runway model, and I, I'm sure that you were busy doing that, and, and, and BJ having an established career in on TV, wasn't it, wasn't it hard for you to walk away from that? I mean, going to San Diego, San Diego doesn't strike me as a hub of entertainment by any means. What was that like for you to walk away from something that could have been developed? I mean, you were just getting started. Well, it was, I think for us, we had, we, we got married and we had kids. So by, by the time we went to San Diego, we had two kids and it's much more suburban in San Diego. So it was a great place to raise our kids. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't that hard to walk away from in the sense of as you're growing spiritually, you're learning um layer after layer of what really is important what really matters mm -hmm. and so and so it really isn't a, it really isn't a lot to walk away from I because see. what what we're talking about when we say those things we're talking about earthly things rather than heavenly things right so how many kids do you have and how old are they we have two kids we have cole who's 21 and uh, he's our son. He lives with us here in Reno. And then we have Mason, who's 23, and she lives in LA. And she uh, graduated from UCSB, UC Santa Barbara, basically in film. And now she's going to UCLA, and uh, she's uh, working on uh, post grad and pursuing her film career and making films, documentaries. I see. So she wants to be a director. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So it's it that. Uh... Genetics is being passed on to to your, yes. your daughter. There you go. That's great. 
Now, what, what brought you to Reno? I mean, of all places here, I, I, I know that you were raised in Southern California. We talked about this this last summer and then earlier. Uh, but, you know, I, I grew up fairly close to, to Reno, Nevada. And, I mean, it, you can't imagine a place that's probably more different than Southern California than Reno, Nevada. What brought you there? And you said 2018, right? Yeah. A number of things. It's really all hand of God, Acts 17, you know, times and places, God determining that. Um, I was in Temecula and leading that smaller church after being in two large churches, LA and San Diego. And um, I was in a small conference um, in in uh, Orange County, actually. Um, and I was talking to one of the evangelists about the needs in small churches, that they're very different from the larger churches. And the smaller churches had not matured as well as the larger churches, even though some of these smaller churches were were very close or even right next to the larger churches. So we were having uh, this, this dialogue and at the conference, and then I, I brought up the Reno church from looking at the end of year stats for a number of years. And I said, like, for example, this church, in you know, why is it always less than 30? people? Right. And the brother said, well, it's interesting that you mentioned Reno because, because two of the lay leadership uh, brothers are here at this conference, if you want to meet them. So I went upstairs and sat down with them and asked them a lot of questions over lunch and promised that I would come out at some point and just visit the church and, and encourage the church and see what's there and see if we compare notes uh, about small church culture and dynamics. And um, uh, God being God, uh, we ended up coming out here a few years later and we've been leading the church for the last few years. Okay, well, you you had mentioned that you're close to 60 and, and BJ, you guys are right yeah. around that that age period. I mean, that must have been pretty scary. How, how can that church even come close to supporting you guys? Well, because they had not had any staff for 15 years, there was no staff expense. So they had somewhat of a financial reserve. Then right before we got here, they, um, they received the benefit uh, of the church planting and strengthening program in the Pacific Southwest, uh, a three-year program. So they received the first year of funds right before we got here. Okay. Okay. Terrific. So what's, what's the city like? We've got people listening from South Africa. We've got people listening in, in India right now. Can you explain what Re- where Reno roughly is and what it's like, the city population? Okay. So Re- Reno is, um, it, it's a, it's a city, it's about 270,000 and there's, there's suburbs, there's city. Um, it's very rural in certain areas. Um, it, it's, it's got maturity and then it's got, uh, a kind of a brand new, if you will, suburban development on one side. Um, and it has it, it, it's it's a small city, but it has everything. It's mm-hmm. kind of like uh, if you're in the U.S., it's kind of like an old Las Vegas, but it's much smaller. And it has its own long history and connection with Las Vegas. Um, but there's a lot of, of uh, there's a lot of corporations out here. Tesla's out here. Panasonic's out here. Amazon's out here. Um, but there's a lot to do. And it's, it's a small, it's, it's, it's called, uh, the biggest little city in the world. And it really is that it's this tiny city, um, two hours from Sacramento, California. I see. It's interesting because I I grew up just on the other side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range in a little town called Nevada city, California. This was after I was born in Oregon. I moved down there when I was like six and my parents would drive across the mountains and go gamble it at John, <laughs> John Esquaga's Nugget, the sold uh, casino there. And I remember they would force me to sit right by the, uh, there's a little kid set. It wasn't really a kid section, but just a 
place near the restrooms where they would sell used uh, cards, and I would just sit there and <laughs> wait, while, <laughs> wait while my parents gambled. <laughs> That's my memories of Reno, but it's fantastic. Now, when you got there, can you can you tell me what condition was the church in? What what was the church like, and and where what well, where where had it been up until the time you got there in 2018? Well, it, it had been in a really unique place because it had been less than 30 members for quite a long time. It was 28 members when we got here, and but that was the norm for years, and um, they hadn't had real staff for about 15 years. So they were basically like a like a large family group leading themselves for, for a, quite a long time. And um, I would say uh, that they were they, they were ready to be led. And they had a lot of bad habits and patterns that had to be corrected and um, and they wanted to be inspired. So they were they were tired, but they were very hopeful and very willing. Mm. Okay. You know, I remember monitoring, just like you said, looking at the statistics and I would see Reno every year. And just, just like you said, it was right around 30. And I, I'd once, once in a while I'd run into people from the church and I just think what is happening with that church? And then I would hear about leaders going up there from time to time and they'd either disappear or walk away. Yeah. Or, I mean, it was a, yeah, very unhealthy situation from my perspective. Um, <clears throat> walking into it, well, well, first of all, how long had, when was the church founded? What's, how long has it been around? Do you know? About late 90s, about 97. Okay. Somewhere right around there. Yeah. Did it just spring up organically or was it actually planted? It was planted. Um, it was planted and um, there was a couple here. And then in 2004, that couple stepped out and um, like, like much of the church globally, uh, it just declined. So the most that the church had ever been was 85. Okay, so it had been like 85 members at one point in time, yeah. at, at its peak, probably pre-2003. Right. Okay, great. Now, um, what kind of growth have you seen over the past couple of years that you've been, been there? So the growth has been really interesting. Um, we're at 51 right now. Wow. And we're working with, and this is, I, it, this is gonna sound crazy, but we're working with 22 people right now who have either contacted us and said they were moving in, who are others who are coming from a mainline church, uh, kind of a second wave, because we've experienced a first wave, which increased, uh, uh, which added nine members to the membership and then we have people who are studying. So, so of that list of people, there's 22 people. That's amazing. So almost half of your membership, you've got people studying the Bible. You've got like 20, 51 members, 21 people wanting to study the Bible or place membership. Right. Okay. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, that's, that's, first of all, that's amazing. I'm just, this is yes. why I want to talk to you, Kai, because knowing that that situation was doing poorly for so long and now you've nearly doubled it in two years is blow away. And yeah. I think there's a lot of small church leaders out there that are going, man, I'd love to see that happen in my church. And yet there's, you know, a lot of discouragement going on and it's compounded by COVID. And what you're saying is that you've got people, 20 people want to study the Bible during COVID. Let's, let's talk about that. What, yeah. what was your first step? For you and BJ walking into this situation, like you walk in and you go, okay, this has been dead for years. What was your first step? How how did you approach it? The, the first step for us was to correct uh, basic issues um, and very simple things, from how the worship services were run to uh, they didn't have midweeks at all. Uh, for various reasons. So we scheduled in midweeks. Um, and then the services at times would start 20 minutes late. And that was common. And I, and I think this is these kinds of bad patterns, bad habits and patterns are common in small churches, especially ones that are not being led by staff or trained staff. 
So we had to correct all of that. Um, but the goal, honestly, in the very beginning was, was not for people to bring a lot of people. I didn't discourage evangelism at the same time. I didn't want people to bring people to a church that wasn't healthy. Right. So really it was a matter of establishing good habits and patterns, running on time, getting more connected through, uh, fellowship, a uh, better worship, uh, connected midweeks where there is less preaching and more discussion groups so they could get to know each other better. Um, and then putting more of the word in front of people in different ways so that they would retain more of the word and the word would dwell in them richly mm. as scripture says. So to me, if all that's happening and there's a lot of prayer, I practice uh, long hours of meditative prayer over each member. So I have a, I have a five by eight card that I work from and it has everyone on it. And I go out and pray, uh, for two to three hours a day for the congregation. And so if it's spirit driven and spirit led, then you're, you're more spirit reliant rather than reliant on, uh, your approach. Your technique. Okay. And let let me just, work. let me just interrupt you right there. Okay. That, that seems, I go, okay, hang on there. You mentioned this in a, in a previous meeting we were in, uh, in the Pacific Southwest a few days ago, two to three hours a day. Okay. Yeah. Who does that? Okay. What, I, is this actual <laughs> prayer two to three hours a day? What I, I'd like you to, I was going to ask this later in the program, but can you just go into that? What, what's actually happening there and how that got started? That seems like a but, long so, time to me to pray. It, 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 it is. And I, I, I've told this to the congregation here many times. I, I didn't start practicing this kind of meditative prayer. Um, I didn't practice it the first 20 years I was in the ministry. I, I would pray probably just like every other minister or every other person, which is, you know, 15 to 30 minutes a day and earnest, but not deep. <clears throat> but, um, a number of things really influenced me. One was I was in this, I was in a staff meeting of a really large church uh, a number of years ago, probably about seven or eight years ago. And in this particular meeting, a lot of the senior staff was out of town and, and about 25 uh, junior staff or interns were in town. So there was a meeting and there are a few senior staff members there, but most of it were, were interns. And we, every person shared in that meeting and most of the 25 interns who were there basically were sharing that they were frustrated because they felt like the older generation of members and ministers had an expectation of them that they couldn't meet and that they hadn't, they hadn't seen the miracles of our organization haven't seen them. Right. right. And they didn't see, and to them, they didn't see the older members and ministers, um, really, really making those miracles happen in their time. And so they were really frustrated. Right. And that really moved me toward, okay, I've got to, I've got to do better. Mm. I, I feel, I feel challenged by that. Wow. So, <clears throat> So I started practicing meditative prayer and meditative prayer for me is I'll go out and, uh, I usually go somewhere, somewhere outdoors and I will, um, I'll, I'll walk or I'll sit still for a while, be really, be really calm and then start to praise God. So a lot of praise, then I'll start to go through needs of the members. As I'm going through needs of the members, um, I'm asking God how to best shepherd uh, different situations with different people. Um, so I'm asking a lot of questions. And if I'm doing this for a membership of, let's say, 30 people, that takes quite a while. That's right. a lot of time. Right. And if I'm asking questions, <laughs> asking questions and then being still, that takes even more time. So to, to be still and praise God, 
that can go, you know, 45 minutes to an hour or, or 30 to 45 minutes. But then when you start getting into the membership and that's where I feel like that's where the prayer gets really exciting. Um, I'll be asking questions and, and then it, that brings more questions. So as I'm praying, I feel like God is revealing more as I'm going from question to question to question. And so I'll, I'll think of a situation and I'll say, so father, how do I best shepherd this person? And in this situation, what is it that you want? Is the way that I'm doing it right now pleasing you? Is this the direction you want us to go? And so that for 30 people, that's a, that takes a lot of time. Absolutely. You know, the, larger, the larger your ministry grows, <clears throat> the more time it'll take. So I, I don't pray for three hours at a time, but I'll get in an hour and a half, usually in the morning, and then another hour or vice versa in the later afternoon. Okay. That leads me to, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to interview you today um, is because I had talked about some aspects of meditation at that lesson with the Pacific Southwest. And I, on episode 65, I talked about increasing the quality of your thought life. And so when you talked about meditative prayer, definitely want to talk to you about that. Cause I totally, you know, my antennas pricked up when I, when I heard that, what happens when you're, when your mind wanders, what do you do when you're, you're praying for people and you're asking God, and this is a challenge with meditation how do you stay on track? How do you stay focused? If I get off track, I'll often, I'll stop and I'll apologize mm -hmm. basically um, to God. And, um, and then I'll just continue. But I, I find that the more I practice this type of deeper prayer, the less distracted I become mm -hmm. because I get, it, it, it creates momentum, mm -hmm. passion. Um, it's, it's like you're trying to solve a problem, right. uh, in a sense, <clears throat> you're bringing things before God and then God is literally revealing things to you in the middle of the prayer itself. Mm. Um, revelation, insight, encouragement, mm -hmm. um, so many, there's just so many miracle stories, so many miracle situations that have come from this, this type of prayer. When I first started, um, I was working with a small church and, um, I would go out there and I'd be, I would literally be in this park for three hours. <laughs> I would go out at sunset and then I wouldn't leave until about nine. And if I walked around the park, it took eight minutes to walk around this little park. So if I walked around, um, if I walked around eight times, that was an hour. But then I started noticing that I was walking around the park 24 times and it wasn't hard. And then I would sit in the middle of the park where there were no lights and it was really dark <laughs> and, and, and you couldn't see me. I mean, that's how dark it was because there was, <laughs> it was like in the middle of a soccer field, but then I'd be looking up in the sky and the sky would be really clear where I was. And so you would definitely feel like you were in the presence, wow. but there was that. And the other thing that really helped me, um, and this came from a lot of different influences, but. I pray to God, the father, and I pray to the spirit, Holy spirit. And I pray to Jesus separately because it helps me to better identify with the different aspects of the Trinity. Right. And, um, and it's just for me, for my personal experience, it's much more compelling it's right. being distracted. So Hebrews five, seven describes Jesus prayer life, Hebrews five, seven. And, and basically that scripture talks about how Jesus cries out, um, petitions God, and that that was his prayer life. Mm -hmm. And so if that was his prayer life and you think about time, I can't imagine Jesus praying for a short period of time and being distracted. Now, obviously he's Jesus, but at the same time, his prayer life is so well described there, so well defined that I feel like if we go in more of that direction, 
rather than um, counsel. Uh, you know, we, we, put, we put an emphasis on counseling, having, having conversation and discussion, but if we would put more emphasis on prayer and activating the spirit in these mm -hmm. situations, mm -hmm. I think we'd be much more effective. And, I, and I'm, and just to be clear, I, I am completely for counseling. I'm completely for professional counseling and for pastoral counseling. But I think that if we prayed more, that there'd be more of an activation of the spirit and the spirit would work through difficult situations and we'd have much better results. I totally agree with you. Now I'm going to play devil's advocate and okay. I'm sitting here as a person going, okay, that sounds great in theory, but that's a huge investment of time. Mm -hmm. And as a busy person, busy minister, paid or non-paid, am I really going to see the results? Am I, am I going to be rewarded with, with good things if, the, if I devote that much time or even an increase in the amount of time? What, what kind of miracles have you seen as a result of this kind of prayer? Okay. Um, in, the, in the two years that I've been here in Reno, that each and I have been here in Reno, I've rarely talked about evangelism. Rarely. I mean, almost never. And, and not because... I don't think it's important, but I felt like the, the, the smaller church is the foundation of the larger church. So this is an important time for this small church. And it, it, if I can instill in this smaller church, the importance of prayer and the depth of prayer and how powerful it is, then, then that foundation will be will strengthen the larger church as we grow in number. Right. So, <clears throat> so first of all, the, the fact that we've gotten from 28 to 51 members right. and have 22 people, that's all been through, I, I've, I, that's all through the spirit. Wow. God's done that. God's done that. Um, second of all, there, there's a, there's, a, there's a number of, like, like there's, there's two couples I can think of off the bat. One of them is newly married and the other has been married for uh, quite a number of years. There have been issues in both marriages, deep um, emotional issues. So when I've gotten with both of these marriages, I have spent a lot of time in prayer, a lot. And just asking God, God, he, here's an issue in their marriage, this marriage. How do you want me to approach it? What's there? I, I see this and this and this, God, but what, what do you see? And, 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 and while I'm sharing that, Father, my, at times my heart isn't in the right place to shepherd them. Mm -hmm. so show me where my heart is in the right place. Show me, <clears throat> show, show me where I've got to grow. As, because you've brought me here to shepherd these brothers and sisters, show me. And if I'm praying this daily, then getting with them, the, the results will be much better. Mm. And so, and so with both couples, I have done that, gotten with them, then also referred both couples to professional counseling. And both couples have done remarkably better. Wow. In their marriage and in their walk with God and, and in their life as disciples. So one of the couples, the younger couple, um, there's a clarity to them now that wasn't there when they first got here. They've been here for about a year. And they have some severe challenges from early life trauma. But if you if you had video of them in conversation a year ago and you saw them now you would you would you, you'd be scratching your head like how what happened to that person and i think it's i think it's the spirit healing them from a deeper place wow does does your congregation know that you're praying this much for them yeah i talk about it a lot they must they must be really surprised what's their response at, at first, it's hard to it's hard to fathom, like it was, like it is 
when you're listening to it. Right. And uh, so, so, so here, here I'm very ink and paper. I'm very low tech. <laughs> so, so th this is this is one of my five by eight cards. Right? Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So when we first got here, uh, basically this column and a portion of this column was the total membership. Mm -hmm. Now it's all of this. That's is amazing. The, the whole membership. Mm -hmm. And this is that list of 22 people I was talking about. Right. Okay. So most of the time I can go out and I'll have this list in my hand. I'll have this actual card in my hand, but most of the time I can go out and I can pray through this entire list from memory because I've done it so much. Wow. And, and I think about examples like Moses goes to the mountaintop in the presence of God comes down and he's he's lit up he's literally lit up right and if i am if i'm going to preach if i'm going to counsel i have to have a similar spiritual glow if you will wow i have to have spent time with god because i'm trying i'm not trying to fix people i'm trying to get them closer to god so that god can fix them that's a that's a great approach. That's a great approach. Let's let's go back here and talk about when you first arrived. What was the attitude of the members to to your leadership? Prior to you coming, there had been another leader. That person left. I, it wasn't a pleasant departure. Yeah. What was the attitude? Distrustful, cynical. Uh, uh, I I would say because the group was eighty five and that was that was twenty eight. I would say the most critical left. <laughs> they already left. They're already gone. Okay. They're already gone. And, and, and those who remain, and again, they, they sacrificed a lot because they had, they had no larger church. So there was no youth program. Almost every member that had kids, none of their kids were faithful. Mm -hmm. None of them. Mm -hmm. So you had families of three, four children. And now their kids are in their twenties and literally none of them are faithful and have no desire for God. So, so you were left with people who were very committed. So their response, their, their response to us was, was very, um, they, they were, they were very supportive. Um, and, and I want to share this for, 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 for church lead, small church leaders who are really thinking about, um, either either their own church or someone who is considering leading a small church. Um, when I got here, uh, I came from Southern California and beach and sun, right? So I get here and it's snow and mountains. So it's still high <laughs> desert in Reno. So I had been here for three months and at, at our Christmas party. So it's the very first Christmas party. The church gave me they, they gave, gave me a, a Chevy. They gave me a truck. They gave me a Chevy Silverado. Oh, wow! Oh now, my it was it, it was from it was from one of the members. One of the members owns a business and it's success. It's a successful business, and he has a fleet of trucks. So it's an old truck, and it has a lot of miles on it. But they gave it to me. Wow! That was two years ago. I still use it today, and it has almost three hundred thousand miles on it. But all I've done to it is I've given it an oil change and changed the battery. That's all I've done. <laughs> um, then they gave me a thousand dollars to register it, to in, insure it, and fix anything that needed to be fixed. Then I told them the first year that I was here that even though I was, would not get a full time salary or, or any benefits whatsoever that if we could afford it, that I would not take a part-time job because I wanted to devote all of my time to learning the church and learning the community. So after the first year, I took a, a part-time job um, with one of the brothers' businesses and uh, you know worked a few hours a week. But in that second year, the church twice gave me retroactive pay wow. for pay that I lost because I wasn't 
uh, working a part time. Wow. And so I know, I know every church is different and I'm sure some small church leaders are, are fighting for every penny that they can get because there's so much upheaval and ill will and, you know, from the past, there are miracle situations like that. Wow. And we're, we're, we're an example of it. Okay. <clears throat> I want to talk more more about that about about your finances. I'm going to come back to that question, yeah. but let me um, ask you this: one one of the most commonly asked questions I get from small ministry leaders, small church leaders, is how do you motivate older disciples, and how do how do you get that larger body of of disciples going who've been around 10, 20, 30? even 40 years at times, mm. get them going and getting, get them fired up about their faith, evangelism, just being fired up anyway. How do you, how do you get that situation going? And especially if you're a younger leader coming in, how do you do it? But how, how did you get your group motivated? You, you've shared um, a little, of course you've shared about prayer. You, right. But Okay. <clears throat> my, my theory um, and I work from a lot of theories. I work from a lot of ideas. So I have this idea. Well, let me try this. Try. So here's my, here's my theory. My theory is, is that every church, regardless of size, 25% is strong, 25% is weak, and 50% is in the middle. And those in the middle, they could be old Christians, new Christians, doesn't matter. They're not going anywhere, but they're not doing anything. They're not inspired. They're not motivated. So if you raise the 50% in the middle, if, if you aim your, your approach to ministry towards the middle, then if you raise that 50%, then you have 75% of your church is relatively stronger and they can help shepherd the 25% that's weak. That's great. So, so I've been working from that premise um, for the last five years and uh, definitely here in Reno for, for the years we've been here and it's been successful. Now, now to be practical, um, I think the first thing you, one of the first things you have to do is you have to do some research on small church culture and dynamics, how, how small churches actually work because it's not the same. If you were converted in a large church and then you go to a small church and you try to lead it, you can't lead it in the same way. It doesn't work. Every church, I know this is said a lot, but it's really true. Every church is different. Mm -hmm. Every church has a different history, different people. You've got to, you've got to pray and ask God to lead you to what's really going to motivate and inspire the church. So that's a prayer that you can pray every day over and over and over again and the spirit will reveal different things now with that being said there's there's a number of books and i and, and believe me, i'm not much of a reader <laughs> i'm very i'm very usa today reader's digest uh, uh you know uh, bullet points uh large font and lots of pictures I, 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 that's me that's me and, and i and i say that shamelessly now but there are two books there are two books um that really helped me a great deal and they're written by the same guy steve Beerley. this is one of them help for the small church pastor wow, steve great. Beerley. help for the small church pastor um, and then his other book is How to Thrive as a Small Church Pastor. How to Thrive as a Small Church Pastor, Steve Beerley. Now, both books basically say the same thing in different ways with different examples. But they both say that small churches, um, small churches have... Uh, uh, a, a, an influence factor of um, of either patriarchal or matriarchal, it's either a man or a woman or a group of people who influence the church, whether they are leader in leadership or not. And so it's very relational. And to break through that from the outside is very hard. So you.
You've got to pray through and it was relationships over time. And it takes time. When we got to Reno, we knew from experience, from experiences, good and bad, that we couldn't just go in and change the church. It had, we had to approach it very slowly. And so with that, with that, my, my other theory is, is if you are going to raise the middle, you have to get the word into people in ways that are accessible, easily accessible. So, uh, one of the things that I do is, and this is on our website, the Reno church website. So I, I, I preach from an outline. So it looks like a bulletin, but it's really the majority. It's not all of my lesson, but it's most of my lesson. And there, and there's literally, uh, lines, spaces on the bulletin to, to write. So, so the outline is the scriptures, uh, most of the scriptures. And then if I have any quotes or anything like that, then that's in there, graphics and so forth. So I'll preach through this. Then at the bottom of it, there are scriptures listed that I purposely don't preach from, and they're called scriptures for further personal study. So you'll get this printed on Sunday. And then Monday, I, I tell the congregation, review this and then add these extra scriptures uh, in your quiet time. Then on the back of the same outline, there's a devotional about the same topic that has scriptures in it that you can also use. So again, the theory is, is that if I do this every Sunday and two midweeks out of the month, that means 20, out of the 30 days of a calendar month, you have printed material for quiet times for the average member in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that for five years to here in Reno and the churches that we've worked with where I've done this, they've every one of them or both of them, they've grown every year. They've never not increased. That's okay. Let, let me just stop you right there. So okay. repeat that 20 out of 30 days, there's material. Yeah. So, so if I, if, if you come on Sunday and you're looking at this, you get this outline, mm -hmm. then you're going through it with me on Sunday. Then on Monday, you're going to review this and then add these extra scriptures. Right. Then on Tuesday, you're going to go through this devotional that's tied into the sermon. Wow. So that's three days. Right. Now, if that week there's a midweek, which is Thursday, you'll get another one of these. And then if you, and if you go to Sunday, you'll get another one of these again. So 20 <laughs> out of the 30 calendar days, you have a quiet time. And what's, the great, awesome. what's the greatest challenge for the suburban Christian is having quiet times. That's amazing. If I make it easier for you. I don't do them for you, but if I make it easier for you, you'll have a better chance of spending more time in the world. Can I ask then you I, to please email me a copy of, of one of your devotionals or your bulletins that you yeah. hand out? And and if yeah. it's okay with you, I could make it available along with the, the names of those books that you recommended. Yeah. And we can yeah. post it on the, on the notes of the podcast. Now, the other two things that have been super helpful and it, it costs money, uh, but really not that much money. Yeah. One, one is, is <clears throat> I teach from after, you know, every, every once in a while, like maybe, uh, once a year, twice a year, uh, I'll use simple books like Tom Rainer's I'm a church member. Right. Okay, this is really basic stuff. Simple read. Um, I'm a slow reader and I can read it. <laughs> I can read it in a couple hours. And if I can read it in a couple hours, then anyone can read this book. So this, this book is 79 pages, 79 pages, uh, hardback. It's been out for quite a while. You can get 20 of these $5 each christianbook.com and you can get them less than that on eBay. If you, if you find the right seller. So what I do is this and, and really think this through. So what I do is this is, is I buy about 50 of these books, 60 of these books. 
Then I take a handful of them and I give them to people in the membership and I tell them, go read it. And then tell me what you think about it. They'll go and read it. And then they usually love it. And then I go, okay, now share it with other people in, in the church. So they'll do that. Then I'll take another handful and I'll hand them out to more. Until I cover the whole church. Then once I cover the whole church and they're all reading it, then I tell them three months from now, I'm gonna teach on it. And they have this running start basic teaching and the word of mouth has really influenced the body. And so people are already talking about it. So by the time I teach it, I'm basically teaching them something they already know, but it goes further. The retention is deeper. And we're talking about the word dwelling in us richly, right? really about retention. And even in Luke and the parable of the sower, uh, Jesus talks about retention. When he's explaining the parable, he, those who you know hear the word and retain it, he talks about retention. And I think if you can get more of the average member, including the older members, to read something simple like this, that they've already read books like this, but when they read it, it is easy to read, so it's convenient. Older members. Um, especially in the suburbs, they usually are raising kids and um, they're busy. So, so you can't give them something thick and something that is too involved. You have to give them uh, spiritual food and small bites that they can really absorb. Mm. So by the time I teach it, they're fired up about it and they've talked about it a lot. Right. And so they'll retain more, they'll right. retain more uh, and then they'll use that in in, um, in helping others and shepherding others. The yeah. other thing is, and this is this is th this to me is one of the greatest tools around. And again, for simple readers like me, <clears throat> this is a life application Bible. Life application Bible. Graphs, charts, profiles, biographies, and commentary. Most people uh, in the middle have never read a commentary. They almost don't even know what a commentary is. So what I do is, is I buy, um, I save some money in our personal budget. And then I have uh, some friends outside of the Reno, outside of Reno, who've been in our ministries and they'll donate some funds as well. But what I do is, is I give these away to members in the congregation that I feel could benefit from it. Because because one of these, this is a newer edition, but the older editions in this bound, um, in this bound faux leather, um, one of these is about $60. Wow. You can get older ones for about 40. But if you have a membership of let's say 30 to 50, every once in a while, when you have some money in your budget, you can get them on eBay, you can get them used. I try not to get them used, you can, you can find them new. But what I do is, is I give these to people from the pulpit. <laughs> and I walk up to them and then I, 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 I hand them the Bible, but I keep the box. So here's the box and I purposely take it out of the box and I hand it to them. And I said, I'm keeping the box because I want you to read it. I don't want you to leave it in the box. <laughs> <laughs> But then uh, all of my leaders have one of these. And so when they're studying the Bible with people, they can share simple insights. And then, and then often if they're studying the Bible with, with someone, I tell them, if you can have your small group pitch in, get them one of these Bibles. Right. Because it's a, it's a very simple, the commentary is simple. It, it, it's easy to understand people oftentimes they either don't know their Bible well because they're overwhelmed by everything that's in it. Um, and they don't know how to approach it from a simple place. But this makes the word more accessible and they retain more. So Kai, BJ works a full-time job. What, yes. what are the pluses and minuses of that arrangement? Um, we're, we're very blessed in that she is serving the poor in the community. That's her job 
working for a nonprofit that works with the poor. So um, the pluses are uh, she is more involved with the community and has more access to the community than she would have if she was on staff because she works directly with the poor every day. That's her, that's her job. And, um, and so if I would, I would, uh, recommend that if, if a couple was going to take over a smaller church and one of them, one of them had to work, <clears throat> see if you can find a nonprofit that serves the community and work there. It doesn't pay a lot. Um, it doesn't pay a whole lot, but, um, a church this size with its financial reserve and obviously we got some outside support as well, but a church this size is usually in a smaller, it's usually in a place where the cost of living is lower than saying living in a larger city. So in Nevada, uh, there's no state tax and the cost of living in Reno is less, much less than it is in California, especially Southern California. So <clears throat> you don't have to make a lot. You wanna make sure you make enough, of course, but you wanna walk through that with your congregation, with your leadership and make sure that you're getting enough support. So. So the, the plus is that BJ is in, uh, she's in a non-ministry environment. So if you've been in the ministry for a long time, like we have, it can be very inspiring because it's a brand new environment and you're building relationships. There's a number of people that she works with that attend different churches. And so for her to be a minister leading a church with her husband, but yet being able to do this nonprofit work, um, the outreach is great. Mm. And, and, and we meet because there's fundraising for the nonprofit, we meet a lot of the uh, higher ups in the city on a regular basis. That's great. How do yeah. you keep BJ from just getting burned out, working a secular job, then working as a women's ministry leader in your church? Um, how do you manage that? How do you protect her so that she's not just frazzled? Um, if, if the husband is the evangelist and he's leading the church, then you have to protect your wife first above everything, above everything, above any need within the church. The, the church can't come first. Your wife has to come first. And she's come. So, so I ask the question often, how's the pace? How's the pace going for you? And she knows exactly what I mean. And if, if it's too much, she'll tell me. Uh, but most of the time, uh, she does pretty well. And, um, and like I said, we've been doing this for a long time. And so she knows how to pace herself through things like today, uh, we've been doing community service projects through the nonprofit. So yesterday we were working with the poor, um, uh, doing some incredible things, uh, for kids who have nothing, I mean, nothing. They live out of their cars and they attend public school. They live in motel sixes and they live, they, they attend public school. Um, and we, we took 25 of them to a Walmart and they each had a $150 spending limit. Wow. And most of these kids, not all of them, but most of them, all they wanted was food and clothing. They didn't want any toys. Oh my gosh. It, it, it's so, I mean, we had disciples come and volunteer and, and we're walking around with the kids and, uh, they they, they held it together. The <laughs> disciples did, but then when they got outside, they were just crying. Crying, oh. crying, crying. So, so those are all the pluses that you have these, these impactful moments. The, the, the only minus is that there's less availability, less availability to shepherd. So you have to adjust your expectation. Mm -hmm. um, there'll be times when you, when you as the evangelist see a need in the women's ministry and you, and your temptation is to want it to be addressed quickly. Well, you have to rely on more of your leadership than your wife who has a full-time job. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so if you do this successfully, you'll be amazed at the results because this year, my wife not only launched a podcast while working these two jobs, but she also this year wrote a book and it's being published by Harper Publishing probably in January. Wow. And what's the, and what's so, the book about? Uh, it's called Rebound, Staging a Spiritual Comeback. It's all about um, 
it's not about an autobiographical. It's really about how to uh, make a comeback, if you will, spiritually, especially if you're an older Christian, and um, and move forward in faith um, in that place in life. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> to to me, when I when I hear about the the growth of your church and the things that you're sharing, I just go, wow, that's really amazing. There's got to have been some low points. There's got to have been some times we just go, oh my gosh, is this really going to turn the corner? Can you share with me uh, a time when you really faced a low point and, and how'd you work through it? What, what brought you through it? Here in Reno, you're talking about? In, in Reno in particular, yeah. But you, okay. if there's something else that you can share, it's not a problem. Okay. Well, um, much of those two books that I referred to earlier are talking about dynamics in smaller churches and how sometimes you, you can be in a small church and um, uh, members or, or, or leadership can turn, basically turn on you and, and not support you and even get, get to the point where you're fired, which has happened to us. And um, when that happens, obviously uh, you're, devastated um, it, because you're thinking about not only your well-being and providing for yourself, but you're also thinking about your family, you're thinking about the faith of people. <clears throat> um, but what I like about these these two books by Beerley is that they're, they're, it's common. It happens across all denominations. Right. This happens all the time. Right. And, and you, you have to be, you have to be aware of it and then and then work to avoid it. So when, when it did happen and we were at a low point, um, uh, at one point we were, um, we were literally living out of plastic bags. Our stuff was in storage and we were staying from in friends' homes uh, for months. We did this for months and months and months. At one point, one of our friends who, was, who had happened to be in our ministry at the time when we were let go, um, we stayed in the upper, uh, upper floor of their house, their two story house, they were retired. And so me and my wife, our son and our dog lived in their house and they wow. fed us every meal. Oh my gosh. Every meal. And, um, and our stuff was in plastic bags and you'd kind of like, kind of go through, okay, I, I got a shirt over here. I got, this over. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, it was bad. Wow. Um, but during that time, when when the adversity comes, the adversity comes, you, you want to use it to refine you. Mm -hmm. You 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 only fail if you quit, mm -hmm. and so you want to use it to refine you. In that, you can do everything right, and still be in a difficult situation. Right. But it, it isn't a matter of right or wrong. It really is a matter of of persevering through the struggle to let it refine you to become more Christ-like. Hmm. So I would get asked, so there, there was a nine month period before we got to Reno <clears throat> where I was interviewing in different parts of the country and talking to people and, and places that I thought, okay, we're, we're a shoe fit. We're a glove fit for this ministry. We weren't hired. Hmm. Um, and, and, and it was hard, but in it, I never felt like I never was bitter towards God. I didn't feel like God had let me down. I didn't feel like it was God's fault. And I, I just, I, I just didn't think that I, I, I felt like this is an exercise of faith. So people were asking me, um, so did you, you know, I was working in that city or that, that church or that, church. are you going to get hired there? I go, I don't really know. And they would say, how long can you go? And um, I go, well, I can go till probably like the end of July. And then after that, I'm going to have to get a regular job. So, um, so what happened in that, in that period of time was to, to use Reno as an example, um, I told BJ, look for work in every city that I interview in. Mm -hmm. And so she would go online, indeed.com and monster and look at, you know, and she would apply for work in every city that I interviewed in. And um, so when it came to Reno, she was offered a job in Reno. And 
Reno wasn't ready to hire us yet. So I said, turn it down. Now she was working as a substitute teacher at the time, but she had until basically the end of June and then neither one of us would have a job. So um, she turned it down. Then she was offered another job in Reno. And I said, they're still not ready. Don't take it, don't take it. And meanwhile, we're running out of money. <clears throat> then she was offered a third job in Reno. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, well, have you, have you done your, your final interview for them yet? She said, no. I said, okay, well put the interview on speakerphone and let me hear it. And so I sat there during her final interview for this job and I'm listening and then it was over and she interviews really well because she was a professional actress. Right. Oh my gosh. I bet. <laughs> so she interviews great. So, so, so she, she hung up the phone and she looked at me and I pointed to the palm of my hand. And I, she goes, what do you mean? I said, you had them in the palm of your hand. You're going to get hired. Right. I said, I said, if they hire you then take the job while Reno is still in the process of, of working this out, if they hire you take the job. And if Reno doesn't hire me, then, then I see that as a sign of the end of, end of my ministry career and I'll do something else. Um, but, but I have faith that they will hire us. So BJ took the job, she came to Reno and, um, I was hired in Reno a week later. That's amazing. What, what a faith building story, just walking by faith. That's incredible. Now, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sharing that. And what's amazing is that it was such a low point and such a, a ch I just can't imagine it. But then it's led, I'm, what makes me think, Kai, is what if you'd quit? then that church would never see what it's experiencing now. And I think there's so many, so many leaders that I know I felt at just times where you feel like, I just want to quit. I'm, I can't handle this pressure anymore. I, I just feel so down. I feel, you know, uh, you know, just disrespected or, or forgotten or whatever. And, and yet you hung in there and, and God brought about a blessing. How do you, how do you deal with that? Cause I, I think the bitterness and the resentment can really, step in there where you start feeling like, Hey, do you know who I am? Do you know where yeah. we've been? Do you know what we've done? Um, yeah. you know, and, and the feelings of entitlement, the feelings of like, Hey, you know, this isn't fair. How do you wrestle with that? So that, that, that doesn't become a controlling influence. Okay. I'm glad you brought it up because everything you just said, I struggle with. Yeah. You know, I've had, <laughs> I struggle with, and I've had struggles with. Sure. So, Absolutely. So I, to all your listeners, I want to make that happen. You know, uh, absolutely clear. Everything that Rob just said, I, I have struggled with and I struggle with to this day. Um, but, but I feel like um, it's all about souls. This is all about souls. So if I stay in bitterness, if I stay in resentment, um, then I, I can't, I can't move forward. I can't help other spiritually. And so it, it's a daily thing. And, and every once in a while, I'll be in a meeting, I'll be in a conversation or something will come up and it'll trigger resentments from the past. And I bring that to God and, and I, and I confess it, but I may feel that on Monday and I may need to confess it again on Thursday. <laughs> you know, it, it just, it just, it, it, it's an ongoing thing. Um, you, I think for some, you, you, you're never going to not feel that to some degree or another, but at the same time, um, it reminds me when I played high school, when I played basketball, um, I was playing a game and I, I, uh, I made a bad play and I was, I was dragging my head, you know, uh, down the court, but the game was still going, <laughs> it was still going. And that's what I think we forget as ministers or as leaders is that, Things will happen, but you have to, you can't stop. You have to keep going. You have to find new ways to allow that situation to find you. Amazing. Okay. 
you may have already covered this, Kai, but the question I had was what three things have made the biggest difference in reversing the direction of your church? And you may have covered it. If you want to just hit it again, that's fine. You've, I know you've talked about prayer. You've talked about these mm-hmm. bulletins that you do. You've talked about your Bibles that you pass out. Is there anything that, that, that you could offer anything else? I, I think um, one of the things that stands out to me that we do today um, in Reno is um, midweeks, midweek services. We have them twice a month and the other two weeks are family groups uh, and the group midweeks. And, um, and you can have, you can meet as family group every week if you'd like, but we offer congregational midweeks twice, twice a week on the first and third in, in this, in where we're at now, we offer it uh, the first and third uh, week of the month. When you have it, my encouragement to you, having done this now for for, uh, eight years, is when you have your midweek, um, make the lesson really short and then make the time for discussion groups really long. If you do that, that that's going to mean that if, if you're thinking across your entire ministry, let's say, let's say midweek, like, like our midweek started seven. And um, we have, you know, we, we, ha- we provide snacks and drinks and so forth, you know, and it's fun and, and it's, you know, there's, there's music playing and, and it's loud and, and um, people come in and, and um, very in casual and very informal. In, in our last ministry before we came to Reno, it was a potluck dinner uh, twice a month, and we met in the cafeteria uh, or the multi-purpose room of a of a elementary school. So we we had full on, you know, potluck dinner, seven to seven thirty, and it, there was loud music and loads of food, and kids were running around. It was crazy. And then at seven thirty, the kids went to children's ministry, and um, then I I taught a brief lesson. For 730 to 7:45, but then from 7:45 to 8:30, people were in discussion groups. Midweek has to be different than Sunday. And and even the approach to midweek is different in that on Sunday, people sleep, they get up, and they go to worship service. At midweek, they've been working all day and commuting all day, and then they grab their kids and they come to midweek. So they're tired. So I asked teaching professionals that were in one of my ministries. One was a supervisor, one was a principal and several teachers. I said, what is the, what is the attention span of the average person at midweek? And they all said about 10 minutes. (laughs) They said, after 10 minutes, you basically lose them. They may be, they, they, they may look like they're listening, but as far as retention, it's very little. Mm. So, <clears throat> so how I set it up was, I would email and text the lead question of the lesson to the congregation. Then they would come in, and I would repeat the lead question, and then we'd pray for the food. Then we eat. Then I'd repeat it again when I started the lesson, and then I repeated again when they went to their groups. In doing this, what I found is, in our experience, is that what people thrive in is those discussion groups. So it's about connectivity. If you can help people get better connected in their relationship with their church, then they'll, they'll thrive, and they'll want to be there. If you don't, if you if you teach for 40 minutes at midweek, they'll only hear about 10. And then they they don't have a renewing experience. So so my approach to midweek, and I tell the congregation this often, is my my approach is to renew and refresh at midweek. Mm. You have to walk out of here in better shape than you came in. Mm. And so what's happened in our last ministry and what's happened here in Reno is that at times 
people are so engaged that even even though they have kids that have to go to school the next day and so forth, um, I literally have to ask them to leave. Wow, that's great. And, and some will stand out in the snow and continue to fellowship after I drive away from the building. Now, okay, this leads to the question. We've got COVID going on. It's been going on since March. Now here it is, December. Are you guys meeting together live? Are you meeting virtually? Like how, like Sundays, Wednesdays, what's what's your pattern? So we, we I'm glad you asked the question. We've been very blessed. We've never not met because of our staff. Um, we have, we have uh, members who have large properties and we can actually meet on their property. Wow. So, so we've never had to rent anything or do any, you know, um, uh, one of the members has this large property, um, rural property, it looks like a golf course. And, um, and so we've met there for Sunday service. Um, and then God being God, um, uh, in October, yeah, in October, as it was getting too cold, at, at, we met at our outdoor facility for the last time. And then a week later, out of nowhere, God gave us a church building that's a mile from our house. Oh my God. And we meet in a church building. <laughs> we, we lease a building from Calvary Chapel. Wow. That's great. Yeah. So we've always met. And even now, the law in Reno is 50 people, w w which meets our criteria. So we, we tell people we have a live stream at 1030 and um, we live stream or we stream the service from the previous week from the church building. And so we do that. And so our members who need to stay at home or are more comfortable staying home, we encourage them, please stay at home. You know, you don't have to come and, and, and to the worship. You can catch everything, including the outline. It's all on the website. And then we have about, um, I would say we have about 30, 30 or so that gather at the building. Um, but the sanctuary is set for 250. Um, but it's all kind of spaced so that e even with 35 people in the room, it still feels good. Mm. And we have, we just do two songs. Everyone wears a mask. They never take off their mask unless they're going up front to lead something. And, um, and we have them, we have hand sanitizer everywhere, social distance, you know, spread out. Um, but we've been blessed in that sense. And so we continue to meet. That's, that's fantastic. And yeah. what, do you, what do you do with the kids? Kids sitting with uh, their parents? The, the kids, it's interesting for us in our, in our previous building, our commercial building, we did not have any real children's ministry space. In this church building, we obviously do. And so the kids, uh, if there are enough kids there, then we have a class for them and, and someone will lead that. It's usually BJ. And then we meet at two o'clock in the afternoon. So there's still sunlight out, obviously it's still sun out. So uh, there's a playground there and the kids can go out there as well um, at one part of the class. So um, we do that. I see, that's great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Any, any advice for those who find themselves in, in difficult ministry situations? And that, and that could be a small church like what you're in or yeah. a small ministry leading a Bible talk where a person may feel frustrated or like, wow, you know. And listening to this, they're like, I'd love to see that happen in my, my life, my ministry. Um, any advice to just mindset-wise or, or you've given a lot already, but yeah. any advice to overcome? Uh, a tough situation? Uh, I, I would say um, get a lot of input from people who have done what you're trying to do. Um, other small church leaders, um, contact them that, that you know who have really persevered and, and get advice and input and experience from them. Um, much prayer about your situation, obviously. Um, and then do the research 
you know, some of the books that, that I suggested and, and then, um, and then this is a shameless plug, but you have to make sure <laughs> that you read this book. You have to make sure that you read this book. And this is why, this is why I, I didn't read it for the longest time. And then I thought I've heard Rob talk about it and I haven't read it. I need to read it. And so, and I've read other materials and so forth. So the reason why I'm saying this to everyone is read this book. It's because how I describe it to people is this is nuts and bolts ministry. It's an easy, even I can read it and understand it. Uh, this is nuts and bolts ministry and it's a hardware store. It's a hardware store of nuts and bolts ministry. Just read it. A lot of your questions will be answered. Uh, in this book, in this book. And what, um, for those not watching it on video, what, what book are you referring to? How to Plant and Grow a Church, a complete manual for small church growth by the one and only Rob Skinner, Esquire. Read the book, <laughs> read the book. Because as someone who has been in large churches most of my career, what Rob is saying in this book, they are they are step-by-step -step practicals of of what you need to do to establish a smaller church. And you're talking about someone who has planted churches in different parts of the country, different parts of the world. So, so he's speaking from experience and, and there's no substitute for experience. So I definitely suggest that. But um, uh, when I was at the small church conference in Wisconsin, uh, was that two years ago, 20, year and a half ago? Actually just last year, 2019. May was, it, was it 2019? Yes. Oh my gosh, it feels like it was a long time ago. <laughs> okay, so I'm at the conference, and um, and I, I'm just there. I, I'm there. I, I just want to learn, soak it all in, and be a part of the fellowship. So, at my hotel, um, and during the fellowship at the conference, um, younger people were approaching me, um, because I'm old, and they they must think, well, that guy's got to know something. <laughs> But people were asking, they, people didn't know me, but they were asking me, they, they would walk up to me and they say, I, I know you don't know me, um, but but I want to get some input from you on what you're doing. And, and I said, sure. And so I would have coffee and lunch and dinner with different people. And we would talk for hours. But here, here's what I here's what I heard in those conversations is a lot of younger people are trying to figure out how to lead a small church effectively. And they have older members. <clears throat> and um and if you're in that situation, and I and I, I actually continue to correspond with a few of, of these of these churches, and, and some, uh, the couple was eventually they weren't effective, so they they were let go, and in others they, they've done some things and they're still there, so they, they were able, able to overcome. But but he, here's what I want to really impress on you is you have to find those older members who who do support you, right. who are who are behind you and you, you want to rely on them and and use them to help you basically win over uh the parts of the congregation that feel that uh, are are opposing you right um and that takes a lot of prayer and humility mm -hmm. and humility um but even if someone is a, if you feel like someone's opposing you, <clears throat> if they're older, they have things to offer. Right. Uh, help get them in a situation where they can offer for it. Use them. They want to be used. They want to be. Um, the the older you get, the, the more you want to feel like you're relative, like right. you make a difference. Right. And so and so, if you respond to them by by isolating them and excluding them, you're working against yourself. Right. You're working against yourself. You want to use them and, and, and you want to get their input as much as you possibly, even if they completely oppose you. you. You want to make sure that they're as used as possible. And then any connections, relationships that you have outside of your small church, however you can, bring them into your small church, either through Zoom or through personal visit and let the older members see that you are connected to a mature, more mature part of the body that they can relate to. And then they feel more 
confident and comfortable with your leadership. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Kai, this has been a fantastic time. I just have to ask one question though. Yes, sir. Tell me about the bandana. Ever since I've known you, ever, ever since I've known you, you wear a bandana. It's it seems to be your signature. Can you can you give me the backstory on the bandana? <laughs> okay, where it started was when I started modeling. I was twenty, and uh, I went to do a show, and um, the designer had this large, really large bandana. I had I had never worn one, and I used to have really uh, thick, thick, thick Hawaiian hair. So hand me this bandana. I didn't really know what to do with it. So I tried to figure out how to tie it. And then someone <laughs> came over and helped me figure it out. But it was a huge piece of material. So I started wearing them back then. And, um, uh, and it was easier. And uh, it was easier than than actually uh, working on my hair. And so I, I just wore them off. Then I just wore them all the time. Then when I was converted um, in, in my early 30s, I was still wearing them. And then I just kept wearing them. But then I noticed when I'd go to conferences of hundreds of people, I was the only person who had one on. <laughs> and, and, and so, and so I don't, I don't, the only time I, well, I, I don't wear them when I'm preaching on Sunday morning because it's, it's too much for some people, but I usually wear them at midweek and everywhere else. So, um, uh, that's where it comes from. That's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> it is definitely an identifier. I mean, you, you can s- spot you anywhere. It's awesome. Well, thank you so much for the for the time together today. Any any final words that you'd like to pass on to those who want to make make their life count? Uh, I I would say just remember it's all about souls. It's all about souls, and when you are. When, when you're down, if you're struggling, if you're challenged, just go back to that. If you're a if you're a small church leader, whether you're on staff or not, if you're leading a small church, everything you do has eternal impact. Mm. Everything you do has eternal impact, and, and God is for you; He's not against you. Right. And so it's all about souls. And if you if you get your motivation there. Um, then you get it in the right place. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate you joining the, the podcast today, Kai. I know it's it's certainly helped me, and it's made me think there's even more. I, I look forward to keeping in touch with you because there's so much I've learned from from your sharing today. And, Amen. Um, and I'm sure that our listeners around the world have, have really benefited. And I want to thank so, you today for, for joining from around the world, wherever you're at in a small church or large church, small ministry. I know that you're a person who wants to make a difference with their life, and I respect you for that. If you're enjoying this podcast, let me ask you a favor. Let your friends know about it and also how to find it. Tell your church friends, your family, and please spread the word. My goal is to inspire you to make this life count, live a no regrets life, and multiply disciples, leaders, and churches. Have a great day and make this life count.